it's time to spin and it's time to ramble so I'm sitting here and I'm spinning some merino and I was thinking about how merino has become the gold standard it's it's ubiquitous in fact when you've got a wool yarn or wool fiber to spin that's n not merino that's usually when you make sure and specify it on a label or tell people what it is that you've got merino is what everybody works with but you know one well, no is the case of course and now I'm going to start rambling about that now sheep there is no such thing as the original wild sheep anymore or at least not that uh, people can find looks like sheep were one of the first domesticated animals that happened about 10 11,000 years ago you know they say the first might have been dogs Huh. But anyway, that's a different, you know what, that'll just be a different post. This one's about sheep. And sheep were first domesticated in places like uh, what we would call Syria, or Turkey, or Iran, in Mesopotamia. And there's a theory that the domestication happened when hunters killed off adults, adult females, and then took the young back with them because they were very docile creatures and took the young with them to be raised in pens and in huts back in the village until they were big enough to be slaughtered and eaten. And the original sheep were not for wool. They were for meat and milk products. They were for eating. And according to what the archaeologists tell me, it was about 2,000 years of that before sheep were used for their wool. That's when uh, wool products and fiber start showing up in the records. Let's see. Now, that those early sheep, they may have been sheared, but you know, some of the more ancient, older, more authentic, if you want to call them, breeds of sheep, um, they molted. They shed off their coats in the springtime. In fact, it seems like the first sheep to ever get to England, which was, I want to say, 4,000 BC, about 6,000 years ago, I think, um, those fibers seem to most closely resemble a breed that today we would call soy, soy, S-O-A-Y, and that's a breed that molts. So, either way, it took about 2,000 years of steady work and steady breeding to get these sheep to make anything worth, har make any fiber that was worth harvesting and using. And I can see how that would happen if you've got the sheep living in your village, then you take the ones with coarser, shorter hair, and you, they get eaten. They get slaughtered and turned into dinner. And the ones with softer or longer or more useful hair are the ones that you, maybe you brush them and you collect their fiber either through molting or through shearing. And they get to live and they get to make more babies. But the truth is, is that for a long time, for a very long time, most sheep were either meat sheep or they were considered dual purpose sheep. Uh, and they were bred for hardiness, disease resistance, fertility, a sheep that could consistently give you twins or triplets, a lot more valuable than one that only makes one baby. And uh, people would take sheep with them everywhere they went, and that's how domesticated sheep spread all over the world. They were taking their food with them. It was, you know, it was food on legs. It looks like sheep moved in to Africa uh, from the Middle East, and they were they show up in the Egyptian records, although they're not popular because Egypt is cattle country. Uh, it took thousands of years for sheep, domesticated sheep, to reach as far as South Africa, which is now sheep country. I think I read the other day there's something like two and a half, three million sheep in South Africa today. There are uh, wild sheep breeds in Africa. I can think of the Barbary sheep, 
but they hardly have any fiber worth uh, harvesting on them at all. They are very beautiful though. So Columbus took sheep with him when he traveled to the New World and he left some in the New World when he sailed away. I think he left them in Cuba and I'm not sure what happened to them but the, the Spanish explorers and the French explorers that followed they brought sheep with them and then they would turn them loose and it's those sheep from the late 1400s early 1500s brought by the Spaniards that became the churro sheep that are part of the Native American traditions today and and a very important part of the Navajo traditions the churro sheep are long-haired very hardy and they make a lustrous fiber maybe not quite soft maybe not as soft as we would like by modern standards and the churro sheep were part of the American history because when the United States government wanted to control Native American populations or put down an uprising, one of the things they would do is slaughter the sheep herds. They might slaughter the people first, but there's plenty of instances where they slaughter the food and source of fiber, of course, uh, and then in the 1930s, I want to say, was the last major instance of the United States government slaughtering churro herds, and that was done uh, in the United States. Most of Northern America was suffering from the Depression and from widespread drought, and it was thought that the land couldn't support churro sheep, and the commercial bred sheep from um, sheep farmers throughout the West. So they started a program where first they bought the sheep and slaughtered them, and then they just took them and slaughtered them. There are still churro sheep today. They are still uh, being raised on reservations and in parts of the American West, and a lot of the churro sheep are fortunately now uh, protected which is good because it's become a rare breed. In fact, a lot of sheep that aren't Merino are rare breeds. Merino became the gold standard and used to be that all Merino sheep were raised and kept in Spain. And it was a BFD. In fact, it was a lot of money. Now the Iberian Merino sheep were mostly owned by nobility. I think there was a few of those herds that were technically owned by the Catholic Church, but they were owned by rich people. And you know what rich people are really good at. They're really good at uh, being rich. They were raised by the peasant class, and there was migration routes throughout Spain that were protected and regulated by the governments. But between, I, I've read that between the years of 1500 and 1800, an average of 7 million tons of merino wool was exported from Spain every year, 7 million tons a year. And in peak years, that number could get as high as 15 million tons. There's a lot of money to be made in these merino sheep. Merino sheep were bred almost exclusively for their wool, not for their meat. They mature quite slowly and uh, they're not necessarily as big and they weren't as hardy and tough or as fertile or as disease resistant, but they made fairly long, fairly soft wool. And that's where all the money was. In fact, it was such an important industry that prior to the 1700s, it was a crime to export a merino sheep from Spain. It was a crime that was punishable by death. And the first known legal exportation of merino sheep happened in, um, I think it's 1723, and they went to Sweden. That was really important. Then there were later gifts from the crown of Spain to various crowns around Europe. Um, these are all very well documented gifts and purchases and transfers and exportations of merino sheep. And they went 
not many at a time. I mean, we're talking like a dozen, maybe two dozen, would form the royal herds of England and France and Portugal and so on. They were prized, they were protected. These were really expensive sheep. Once Spain started giving them up, and everybody wanted them, and they, then the herds were worth a lot of money. Now, Spain, even though they had started slowly, very selectively exporting sheep, they probably still could have held on to their monopoly, and they probably still could have held and been the leaders of uh, the world industry in the sheep herding trade. But then came the Napoleonic Wars, which were fought, ugh, which were fought in Spain for the most part, because while Spain was technically conquered, it was in nonstop revolt through the entire war. The people of Spain were always rising up and rebelling, and Napoleon had to keep a large standing army in Spain. And what happens in those days with large standing armies is they live on the brink of starvation. So not only was the country torn apart by warfare, but almost every animal that could be eaten was slaughtered and eaten. Those, those men, those soldiers, those conscripted soldiers, they were starving to death. And this wool trade never really recovered in Spain. So it's a very good thing for all of us and for the world at large that the Iberian Merino sheep were... For, in the century before exported because they spread all around the world uh, although it was uh, really discouraged there was a blossoming wool trade in the new world specifically in the colonies and um, Virginia started getting their first merinos in the I want to say the late 1700s and early 1800s there was enormous effort put into exporting merino to Australia and a lot of that uh, a lot of those sheep didn't make the journey and once they got there they couldn't survive but people kept at it because this was important because people need their sheep and that's part of colonization and it's part of survival even though we take it for granted today people needed those sheep and they kept at it they got breeds started in the Americas and in Australia and of course today a lot of the merino sheep is raised in places like New Zealand, Australia, Peru, Uruguay. And they've all been crossbred with local breeds and they've been tweaked and they've adapted to suit their environment. So there isn't much of the original Iberian merino left, but there are now merino all over the world. And in fact you can pick it up in almost any yarn shop anywhere like this this is merino it's very nice and soft and fluffy and very easy to spin so there you go oh i remember see this is what happens when you start spinning and rambling i didn't want to end this post without mentioning the uh the pharisee sheep the islands that are over there in scandinavia that are technically their own country under the, mm, under the, what do they call it? Not protection, because they have their own country and their own government, but they are on the Dane, they are part of the Danish Council of Governments, and they raise the Pharisee sheep, and they have their own style of clothing and their own language, and most importantly, of course, they have their own style of knitting shawls, the Pharisee shawl, made from Pharisee sheep. So, sheep have been important everywhere in the world, and they're still important today. So I hope you liked it. Uh, join me again because I do one of the spinning and cowgirl posts about once every two weeks, and of course I have an endless supply of fiber to spin. I hope you'll come back. Enjoy.